is very interesting because very few of us are taught anything about bacteria as we come up through high school or as an adult at any point. We're taught very little about bacteria. And so this chapter is the, the chapter where we learn about the prokaryotic cell, which is bacteria. We're taught pretty extensively about ourselves, what organelles are in there, what it looks like. Most schools will do like a little project where you gotta do the organelles and the cells and build a model. But again, very little with the bacterial cells. So I need to tell y'all some things you don't know yet, right? Y'all hate that because you like the stuff you already know. Okay, so let's kind of start with just some basic characteristics that all cells will have. Um, and what determines something living versus non-living. Because with your microbes, sometimes it's a little harder to tell. If I show you a bacterial cell, how do you know if it's alive or dead? If I show you an organism, um, how do you know if it fits the properties of life or it doesn't? What makes a rock non-living but a, a protozoan living? What are the properties we're looking for? And so there are some things that we, sh that we show, and again, people have chosen this, right? That we have deemed to be the properties of life. So some properties that all living things have is that the first one is that all living things are cellular. Everything, for it to be living, it has to be made of, it, of a cell or multiple cells, or at least one cell. It's gotta be cellular. And all cells have some kind of basic shape to them. They're spherical, cubical, or cylindrical. So there is a, a, a set of shapes that we find that cells follow. And all cells have some kind of internal contents. Uh, that contents will always consist of cytoplasm. So regardless of the type of cell it is, every cell type has cytoplasm. And every cell is surrounded by a membrane. Now we see some differences among the membrane, but every cell has a membrane, right? The membrane is what actually makes the cell. Every living thing, which you could also say means every cell, is going to have some type of genetic information. So we have um, 46 chromosomes. So we have quite a few. Different species, different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes. We'll look at, plants have like 19 pairs or something. Uh, we have 23 pairs, so 46. I think dogs have like 17 or something. And cats have a higher amount. Different organisms have different things. And we'll study with our microbes that they all have at least one. Right, your bacteria just have one. So everything that we're gonna study has at least one chromosome. Um, you will see some differences with that. So ours look like the little X shapes that we're all taught to draw. Um, your bacterial chromosomes are going to be round instead of those little X shapes. But everything, for it to be living, it's going to have at least one chromosome. All cells also have ribosomes. And all cells metabolize. In some way or another. We don't all metabolize the same, but everything metabolizes. There are only two basic cell types. You can take any cell that we've discovered in the world and it's going to be one of two types. It's either going to be a eukaryotic cell type or it's going to be a prokaryotic cell type. Prokaryotic cells are, are bacterial cells. The eukaryotic cells are everything else. Everything else. If it's not a bacteria, then it's a eukaryotic cell type. But those are your two types. If you look across our planet, everything that we've discovered, over half of the organisms that make up our planet are bacteria, prokaryotic cells, quite a bit. Um, when we start looking at, let's see here. When we start looking at the differences between the two, which is what these next two chapters are. Chapter four is all about the prokaryotic cell. Chapter five is all about the eukaryotic cell. We start looking at the differences, what you're going to find, and I've got some of it listed here, is that it's easier to describe the prokaryotic cell by what it doesn't have, because it has very little compared to the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cells, which are animals, plants, fungi, protists, right, that's all, everything that's not bacteria is the eukaryotic cell, so us included. 
Um, the eukaryotic cell has all those membrane-bound organelles that we're all taught about, the Golgi body, the rough ER, um, the mitochondria, the nucleus, right, the prokaryotic cells don't have that. All of those membrane-bound organelles are something that's in the eukaryotic cell but not in the prokaryotic cell. Um, the eukaryotic cells contain a double membrane-bound nucleus that has the DNA chromosomes. Your prokaryotic cells, they still have DNA, and they have an area in the cell where the DNA is kept, but it's not surrounded by a membrane. The DNA has no membrane protecting it. And so we, it doesn't have a nucleus. It just has a place in the cell where the DNA is. Um, prokaryotic cells, again, it's your bacteria. Um, archaea are also listed here. These are the two domains, bacteria and archaea. Archaea are a type of bacteria that like really harsh conditions. You find these type of bacteria. Um, they, are, they seem to have an archaic background. Like, I'm going to think of it like that. Uh, okay. um, you seem to find these in deep volcanoes and darkest parts of the ocean and hot springs. They like really weird places. Yes. I did have a question about the archaea. I was reading about um, because they in inhabit harsh locations. Is there much study on those or they can't really be? No, the study that, because uh, you have to keep them in their, right. their conditions to be able to study them. Really the only ones that we've been able to study like a live sample of is the ones that like the really cold environments like the Arctic and Antarctic right. regions. Okay. And they've got some there that they have found frozen in the ice and they've brought back and yeah. have been able to study them, which is kind of scary because it's something that we don't have part of our experience because it's it's contained and then we uncontain it. And so you're right, there there is some studies being done, but it's more observatory because you have to observe them in their natural habitat or try to replicate that in the laboratory. And it's very hard to do with some of that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, again, prokaryotic cells are best described by what they don't have. They don't have any of that stuff. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have the membrane-bound organelles. They still have the ribosomes, right? Because the ribosomes are not membrane-bound, um, so they're a little bit different of an organelle. Um, but it doesn't mean they're simple. They are simple, but it doesn't mean that they operate simply. Um, they can do all of the same stuff that the eukaryotic cell does. They reproduce. They metabolize. They grow and develop. They do all of those things. And they do it with much less to do it with, right? They have much less equipment to do it with and they're still able to. So who is the simpler one? I don't know. Here is your list of the characteristics of life. Um, there's a bulleted list that basically we've come up with that says that every living thing that we're aware of has not just one of these properties, but all of them. It has to have all of these properties. The very first, probably the number one on the list, is that it has to be cellular based. For it to be a living thing, it has to be cellular based. For something to be considered living, it has to have some type of genetic material that can be passed on to offspring, to future generations. It has to be a genetic material that can be passed on to future generations. For something to be living, it also has to be able to grow and develop, and this actually has a couple of different meanings. Growth and development um, refers, can refer to an organism. An organism must be able to grow and mature and develop throughout its life. Populations of organisms must also be able to grow and develop. They should be able to increase in number. So individually things should be able to grow and develop, and then as a population, living things should be able to grow and develop. Reproduction, this one's pretty straightforward. So for something to be living, it has to be able to produce offspring, either sexually or asexually. So either through uh, binary fission or through mitosis. And there's a, a, a statement that's typically added on to the end of that thought, is that they, it's not just enough that they're able to reproduce asexually or, as, or uh, sexually, but they've also got to be able to reproduce their own kind without the help from another um, species. They've got to be able to reproduce their own kind. Metabolism and enzymes. So for something to be living, it has to be metabolically active. 
And that's one of the things that we'll look at in here when we get into our metabolism chapter with our microbes, because if I were to give you a bacterial cell and you were to look at it in the microscope, how do you know if it's alive or dead? It's kind of hard to tell if something like that is living or dead. What are you supposed to be looking for? Because movement is not always a thing. Some bacteria are able to locomote around and move, but a lot of them aren't. So how do you, how do you know? What are you looking for? And so this is one of the things that we look for with microbes. Is it metabolically active still, or has that all stopped? And this is one of the things that we use to determine cell death is metabolic activity. The other is reproduction. If you can stop a microbe from reproducing, then we, in some cases, combined with no metabolic activity, we'll call that cell death. Now you can stop reproduction and the cell not be dead, but you're gonna end up with a dead end with that cell if you can stop its reproductive activity as well. Responsiveness, um, this can be positive or negative, but for something to be living, it has to be able to respond in some way to its environment. Now, if you're talking about a positive response, that would be like moving towards a light or moving towards a food item or some type of nutrient. Whereas a negative response would be moving away from a toxin or trying to avoid a predator or something like that. So as long as there's some type of response, that's one of the things that we look for. And then transport. Um, for something to be living, it has to have the capability of bringing water and nutrients into the cell and also letting toxins and stuff out. Even our cells have to do that. Um, one of the things that our cells will produce just as a byproduct of metabolizing is hydrogen peroxide. That's got to be broken down and released out of the cell. <clears throat> so, again, it's not enough for just one of these. For something to be living, according to our rules, it's got to be able to do everything on this list. So, think of viruses, for example, with this list in mind. Because I've told y'all several times that we don't we don't consider viruses to be a living thing. For one, they're not cellular, right? Viruses are just a, a sugar protein capsule is basically what they are. They're not cellular. Um, do viruses reproduce? Not by themselves. They have to yeah, have a host. Yeah, right. So not by themselves. They of course they they <laughs> reproduce, right? That's how they infect us. But they use our cells to do it. They hijack our cells and make our cells reproduce them. They can't do it on their own. So technically, by our definition, they are not following the rules of reproduction that we have said it should be. Um, viruses do respond, right? They've got some responsiveness. Growth and development. Um, viruses, there's some debate on this one. Individual virus does not grow. It's the size is it what it was built. So there's no growth there. Um, there is some development, so they do pick up genetics, they can mutate their genetics, there's some developmental capabilities there. And then does a population of viruses, can it grow with help, right? It can with help, it can by itself. So ink on that one. Viruses do not metabolize. They do not metabolize and they do not transport. They do have genetic material. Doesn't follow our rules, right? It's single-stranded DNA and double-stranded RNA, and positive sense this, and negative sense that. They don't follow any of the rules that the rest of the world follows. But they do have magnetic, genetic material that is being passed on to the next generation. Our cells are helping in that process, but it's there. So we don't consider them living. And this is the write-up of all that stuff. Okay, so this image here is a, just a basic demo image of what a bacterial cell looks like. And they're using E. coli as an example, and what they've done is they um, basically, if you were to make a cut in the cell, open it up and look inside, that's what you're seeing here. And so it looks a little bit different than the type of cell we're used to seeing. For one, it's not quite round, it's kind of rod shaped. And E. coli are, they're rod shaped. And if you look in here, there's not a lot going on. The little purple dots are ribosomes. So bacterial cells do have a lot of ribosomes. They're different than our ribosomes, which is a good thing, right? Because we can target differences. Um, the ribosomes is still synthesize proteins, but their molecular makeup is a little bit different. So we're able to target those a little bit. Um, you've got the plasmid is kept here, which is 
we're going to talk about what a plasmid is, but it's the bacteria's extra set of DNA. Um, this is an inclusion granule. It's basically like a storage tank inside the bacterial cell. Um, you've got some different layers here. Bacteria have protective layers. They have like calyx layers. They have capsules. They have endospore formations. They got some extra stuff because their environment changes constantly and they sometimes have to protect themselves as they pass through the GI tract, as they're bathed in a chemical or whatever the, the case may be. Um, <clears throat> they have some things that you don't see on our cells. They have a flagellum here. We, we have a flagellum that's a little bit different, but they basically, they have a tail and it helps them move around. Um, not all microbes have a tail. Right, not all bacteria have the tail. For a micro, for a bacteria to um, be infectious or be pathogenic, um, it has to have, you have the ability to move and to latch onto cells. And so this is important <coughs> to be able to identify. Um, let's see here. The fembrae, we're gonna talk about them as well. They're little hair-like things. Our cells have something that looks similar to that, cilia. Do I remember talking about that? Um, so you are for attachment and, uh, excuse me, fembrae up here are for attachment from like an E. coli cell to our cells or something like that. Whereas with us, the cilia helps bring in food and bring in water and things like that. A little bit of attachment, a little bit of movement, um, but not so with the bacteria cells. And then right here, I'm see what that they're showing, they're trying to show the DNA here, and they're showing, I'm not doing a good job of it, I don't think, but with the E. coli cells, or bacterial cells in general, they have an area in the cell where the DNA is kept, right? We have, we have an area too. Uh, it's called the nucleolus, and no matter what cell you're in, there's an area called the nucleolus where the DNA sits. Our nucleolus, our DNA, is surrounded by a membrane that we call a nucleus. Bacteria don't have that. They just have an area where the DNA sits and it's not surrounded by nucleus. So you're seeing some differences here. We're going to go through each of these. Uh, that's what this chapter is about. But this is your visual of what a bacterial cell looks like. So the way I've got this organized for us to walk through is we're going to start with the outside stuff and then we're going to work our way inward on the cell. So we're going to start with the external structures, the appendages and then work all the way in towards the center. Um, there's two main types of appendages that you'll see on bacterial cells, on the prokaryotic cell. They're, you can break them into two categories. Basically, you have a set of appendages that their job is motility, that they allow the microbe to move around. And then you have a different set of appendages that what they do is they allow the microbe to attach to something. Flagella is your first appendage, your first external structure. So I'm gonna pull up a picture here, but here's your slide talking about the three parts. Um, oh, you don't need me. Oh, we'll get some jumping. Oh, are we out of the Well, we're getting pretty close. So let's move ahead here to the picture. Here's your image of what the flagellum would look like. And they're showing you two different ones here because one of the things that we're fixing to get to in a moment is the difference between the gram-positive and the gram-negative prokaryotic cells. So our gram-positive and our gram-negative bacteria. And how the flagellum is oriented, how it's anchored down into the cell is a little different between the two cell types. So we'll come back to this picture after we've had that discussion and look at this again and make sure we've got what we're looking at here on the differences. But you have... In there? Yeah. Okay. Million of them in a box. We have here with the flagellum, mm -hmm. we have an outer hook it's called the hook, this little capsule that the inner filament, the inner tube is in. And then you have the body, which is the part that's actually anchored into the cell here. And if you look at the size here, 22 nanometers in size. So we're showing this huge picture right here. It's very tiny, right, the flagellum is. Um, what the purpose of the flagellum is, is it, it rotates in a 360 degree range of motion. 
We have one too, a flagellum, but ours only goes back and forth. It does not go 360 degrees. And so what this one can do for a bacterial cell, the prokaryotic flagellum, is as it rotates 360 degrees, um, if it's going clockwise, that's one type of movement. If it's going counterclockwise, that's a different type of movement. Um, but we're going to come back to this and look at exactly what we're seeing here with how it's anchored. I wish they would have. I, I want to start on the outside of the appendages first, but we have not talked about the different cell types yet, so we'll come back to this. But this is what they look like. Um, this is showing you the different types of movements that we see. So let me. Group and figure out what you got. 
Okay. Um, yes, the flagellum is responsible for movement, and so it helps guide that bacteria. We talked about the stimulus being positive or negative, so it'll help it move towards something good or move away from something bad. As far as a micro being infectious for us, the flagellum is kind of important for that because once, uh, not only does the micro have to be able to anchor ourselves, but it has to be able to penetrate through layers in order for it to really do anything for us, um, to hurt us. And so it needs that flagellum in order to do that. The microbes that I ordered for y'all, the ones that we use in here, have been genetically modified, have been, they're basically a mutant version of what's, what normally makes us sick. They've been genetically modified to have the flagellum removed and to have the, um, oh my goodness. Fembre, the looks like silly on our cells, the fembre removed as well, so that if you were to happen to lick a finger or something that has something <laughs> on there, nothing's gonna happen. Now the reason we still be very careful is because do they mutate constantly? Yes. Yes, and they could mutate back to being able to do that. So we're always careful. Okay. Um, and then don't worry about the periplasmic flagella. We don't work with anything here. <laughs> okay, so we're still on the outside, we're still on external appendages. Fembrae are your next one. So the flagella was for locomotion, fembrae is for attachment. They're little hair like things that go all the way around the cell. Not all cells have that, not all bacteria have that. But in order for a bacteria to be pathogenic, to be infectious to us, it does have to have the fembrae because otherwise it can't attach to our cells. And if you consume it somehow and um, it does not have the fembrae, it'll just pass right on through because it won't ever have the ability to attach to anything. So again, that's one of the things we've had removed off the ones that we order. They look like little hairs all the way around. These are E. coli cells that have been stained with some fluorescent stain so that we get a really good image of what this looks like. But these are fembrae going all the way around here. They look like the old little worm, you know, the little worm. Yeah. All the little yeah. very worm. Yeah, they do, don't they? The blue are chromosomes, um, a plasmid and then the chromosomes uh, at both ends here. That's what you're seeing there. But these are E. coli cells. I think there's another, mm, used to be another picture here. But, yeah. Um, pili are another external appendage that we see. This one, it's I don't know why they called it this, but a lot of books, and your book does too, make reference to it being a sex pili, which makes you think reproduction. And so what a pili is, is it's a long tube that can connect one cell to another. And so here's a picture, and we'll come back to this. These are E. coli cells here. Do you see the, the pili, the tubes that are connecting them? Mm -hmm. It's called conjugation when they do this. And this is what enables them to swap genetic information. Dangerous, right? Very dangerous. Not all of them can do this. We only see this ability in your gram-negative cells. Your gram-negative cells seem to be the only ones that can do this. And there's some um, gene that they have in their DNA that allows them to form uh, this pili and, and participate in conjugation. Uh, but if one of them's got some cool something that makes it resistant to a particular antibiotic or makes it produce a toxin that's really hurtful for us, they can swap that and multiple cells will then have that ability. So not a good thing for us. Another layer on the outside. This is not actually really a structure, but more of a layer. It's called the glycocalyx layer. Um, some of your microbes will have this coating around the outside of the cell called the glycocalyx. And it's made up of sugars and proteins. There's two different versions of this that we'll see. Some bacteria form a, a slimier version of this called a slime layer. And it's really loose compared to the drier capsule version. They have different implications. The slime layer is more helpful with attachment to stuff. So the bacteria that lives in your mouth, you know that white stuff you get in between your teeth when you floss? Slime layer, that's what that is. And it helps the microbes kind of um, get stuck somewhere so that they don't easily get washed away. So it helps them with that attachment. 
It also helps them a little bit with dehydration because if they get thrown out on the floor somewhere or something where they don't have access to the right environment or nutrients, they're able to survive a little bit. This layer kind of kind of keeps them contained and keeps them hydrated. The capsule is a little bit more hardy, and the capsule is a little bit more of a problem for us. We like to know if we have a microbe that can form a capsule when we're looking at infections in people, because the capsule um, makes that microbe resistant to our, our white blood cells. Our white blood cells cannot do anything with that capsule, and so cannot get in there and destroy that microbe. Also helps with dehydration. If you put, uh, if you take a microbe that can form a capsule and you put it on a microscope slide and stick it on a light. Um, it will stay hydrated quite a bit longer than if you took a, a microbe and put a wet smear of it on a slide and put a light on it, it's going to dry out really, really quick. So it's just another layer of protection, but this one is a little bit more of a problem because this one provides protection against our white blood cells. Here's an image of the two. Um, the slime layer is exactly as you would picture it, right? Very slimy looking. And then the capsule is quite a bit more hardy. We have a staining technique that we can do that tells us if a microbe is, uh, has, not if it can form a capsule, but if it has formed a capsule. You said the capsule makes the microbe resistant towards white blood cells? Mm -hmm. Basically allows it to hide from them. Um, Yes, this is, um, we don't, I don't have y'all do the capsule staining in here because we're doing so many stains and if we have to drop one, it's the capsule stain. But this is showing you, uh, if you were to be looking through your microscope at a slide that you had applied a capsule stain to, you can identify um, which of these microbes have it. So the, um, this is the actual cell and then this big gapped area here. So all this color is the stain. The whole slide is stained. But you can tell when there's a cell that's got a capsule around it. Do you see how the capsule did not take the stain all the way around? Here's the capsule as well. And the capsule. So all of those are capsules. <coughs> They're really easy to pick out on there. <coughs> okay. Um, we're still on the outside of the cell. We're not on appendages anymore. We've moved on from that, but we're still almost on the outside of the cell. And the reason we focus on that so much, the inside we're going to get to, it's going to look very similar to what you've seen, but that's our first line of thing we got to get through, right? If you're applying um, a, a, some type of disinfectant or antiseptic or an antibiotic, this is the stuff we've got to get through to actually get in there and target the bacteria. Um, the cell envelope is a big one. So this is where we get into gram positive, gram negative. Remember I told y'all there was just some few main points that you're going to be expected to have left this class with. This is one of them, the gram positive, gram negative. So let's look at what this is. I'm going to find a picture I like here. <coughs> this picture here, not the best picture. I'm, I keep doing this to y'all for class, but the, I moved to a new edition and I've updated the PowerPoints and a picture that I use is gone all of a sudden and it's very irritating. Um, this is a picture of the gram positive versus the gram negative. This is only in bacteria, but what we have found is that our bacteria take one of these two types. Either they're going to have this composition of a cell wall around their cell or they're going to look like this as the cell wall around their cell. So let me do a little bit of a, of a drawing here and we'll compare it to this. So Thing you're going to come across 
is that phospholipobiliary, that cell membrane that even our cells have, right? We all know about that. So I'm going to draw the cell membrane here. I'm going to label it CM cell membrane. <coughs> and then what you're going to have is you're going to have space. There's going to be a gap between the cell membrane and the next layer. And that space is called periplasmic space. So we've got our cell membrane here. And then we've got space. So this space right here between these two lines is called periplasmic space. Do they have that written up there? Periplasmic space right here. Periplasmic space. And then on the other side of that is where you start to see some differences between your gram positive and your gram negative. The gram positive cells have cell membrane, periplasmic space, they have a gap, and then they have a very thick peptidoglycan layer. Positive 
because that was the only layers they had. On your gram negatives, there's cell membrane, periplasmic space, a thin peptidoglycan layer, another gap, so more periplasmic space, Gap. So this would be peri periplasmic space. And then their very last layer is an outer membrane. Right? That's something our gram positives did not have. They don't have this outer membrane. negative cell in front of me and I walk up and touch it, what layer is its outermost layer? The gram negative, the outer membrane, right? On a gram positive, if you walk up and touch it, you're touching the peptidoglycan layer. But on a gram negative, if you walk up and touch it, you're touching the outer membrane. And so if I have a person that has an infection with a gram positive cell type, I need to be able to give them an antibiotic that's going to be able to penetrate through this peptidoglycan layer because it's the outermost layer. If I have someone with a gram negative infection, what layer does their antibiotic first encounter? The outer membrane. That's a different kind of antibiotic to get through that. So depending on what type of bacteria you have, you can already have an idea of what type of antibiotic you need to start with, what group of antibiotics you need to start with. So, for example, penicillin. Penicillin works by breaking the peptidoglycan linkages in the peptidoglycan layer. So I think there was a picture of the peptidoglycan layer here. This right here, is the peptidoglycan layer. Um, you don't have to know this structure or anything, but there's a bunch of amino acids here um, and a couple of sugars, and they all bind up, and this is what that peptidoglycan layer looks like. Your penicillins, your cephalosporins, um, the tears in your eyes, the saliva in your mouth, the way that they work, right, your tears have a little bit of antimicrobial property, so your saliva, the way that they work is they target these peptide glycan linkages. They target those linkages and they'll break them. The penicillins, the cephalosporins, the enzymes in your tears and your saliva, they break those linkages. They're basically punching holes in that peptidoglycan layer. Well, what happens if you punch holes in this? Does all of the stuff in the cell kind of leak out? Yeah, it does. So the antibiotic can break this down and then now we have access to the really tender parts of the cell because we've, we've gotten through here. If you give those drugs, penicillin, cephalosporin, to someone with a gram negative infection, well, how do those drugs work? Well, they come up to the peptidoglycan layer and they break those bonds. Where's the peptidoglycan layer? It's all the way in here, isn't it? So these drugs come up and they can't do anything to an outer membrane. They don't have the capability to do that. So do those drugs work on these microbes? No. So one of the things that we'll do next week is we'll practice staining. So I'll give you all, I'll have about six different microbes and you're gonna stain them and see if you can tell me which ones are gram positive and which ones are gram negative. So we have stain that tells us that. We also have different recipes of agar that tell us that and that'll be the next week's lab. I have a question, I'm just curious. Sure. Because I know penicillin can do that. Well, what kind of medication will you give someone with that out of your brain that they will have that? The there's, a, there's a different class of antibiotics for them. The doxycyclines, tetracyclines, um, Bactrim. There's a whole list of, of different antibiotics that will work on gram negatives. The gram negatives are a little bit more... Your gram negatives, a lot of them are your, your enterics gut microbes, the ones that, as long as they stay in your gut, the fecal contaminants and things like that, as long as they stay in your gut, they're, they're fine. But it's when they get out and get in a food or on your hand and they get in your mouth or something like that. So they have 
um, find it here. See these lipopolysaccharides that are labeled here? Little hair looking things that stick out? Mm -hmm. Those are a big problem for us. The gram negatives, the reason that they make us so sick, the enterix do, is because we're very allergic to those lipopolysaccharides. And they produce like toxic shock type syndrome, uh, symptoms in us. And so one of the first things that if you have someone who's got a gram negative, the antibiotic that you use, you try to neutralize those lipopolysaccharides, you can get rid of all that problem. And then you focus on the, the the microbe in general, trying to keep it from reproducing. The drugs that we give people, there's different, y'all heard of broad spectrum, narrow spectrum, intermediate spectrum antibiotics. Broad spectrum means that um, it's a, usually a combination drug, so like um, augmentin, if y'all have kids, probably not augmentin, it's a combination of a couple of amoxicillin and clavamox. It's a gram positive drug and a gram negative drug. So you give them both and you don't have to figure out what they've got. You just give them both and hopefully one of them will work. And if it doesn't, then you usually have to get a culture. And so those broad spectrum ones usually work on both or work on all gram positives or all gram negatives. So that's what the broad spectrum means. But then you have some narrow spectrum ones that only work on certain gram positives or certain gram negatives. And so you only give them in certain instances. We have a whole chapter on that later on. <clears throat> but do y'all see why the gram positive and gram negative is so important? Because when you're looking at how to control a microbe, right? our goal is not always to kill. Kill is sometimes unnecessary. Control is usually enough. We'd love to be able to kill them, but that's not always practical. Controlling the microbe in somebody's body, getting it, keeping it from reproducing, or stopping it from producing whatever toxin it's producing, controlling it in some way. One of the first pieces of information we try to get when it's necessary, is it a gram positive infection or is it a gram negative infection? And there are very quick lab techniques to do that. And so we'll do those this semester and um, learn how to pick those out. So when we look under the line, when we stand up, we'll be able to see that people are like that on the Oh, good question. So what the staining does is it's all color based. And so you apply a set of stains in a particular order, right? There's a procedure. And then the color that the slides enter, the, that the cells end up, once you look at them, tells you if it's gram positive or gram negative. So um, at the end of a gram stain, if you have purple cells, when it's all said and done, that means you have a gram positive bacteria. If you have red cells, that means you have a gram negative one. And so it's all based off of color. Did that go back to like the slides that we were looking at? I know on the mixed protozoa, some of them were like pink, pinkish looking and others were like maybe a turquoise type of blue. Yeah, on the protozoan, that, the colors didn't mean anything. They just did that so you could pick out the different ones because a lot of them okay. were on top of each other. But yes, on your cockeye and your bacilli slides, um, some of you, when you looked at your cockeye slides, saw purple cells, and some of you saw red cells. And so it just depended on if you grabbed a gram positive slide or a gram negative slide. And at the time, we hadn't talked about that, so I didn't even mention it to y'all, but some of you were seeing purple, some of you were seeing red. And that's because they had been already been stained, or you can pick those differences out. Um, the same with the bacilli. But this comes up every week in this class going forward, the gram positive and gram negative. Even with our serratia, I told y'all it was a gram negative, right, a gram negative. Um, and that's what that means, is that this is the makeup of its cell wall versus the gram positive. I got that part? So the purple stain was gram positive. positive. Purple positive. So now that we've got that, let's go back to our flagellar arrangement here. So let me go back to that slide. <coughs> now this has more meaning for us, right? On how the flagellum is actually anchored into the cells. Do y'all see why it would have to be anchored differently depending on the cell type you have? Can you pick out which one's which? Gram negative. Is this gram positive or gram negative? 
Gram positive. Gram positive, right? You've got your cell membrane here. You've got a gap, the periplasmic space. And then you have this really thick peptidoglycan layer. Whereas over here, you have cell membrane, you have a gap, a very thin peptidoglycan layer, another gap, the periplasmic space, and then you have the outer membrane. And that's the key at our membrane. That's how I remember the outer membrane. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a difference in how they get anchored, but um, how they're how they're anchored here, and then when we compare the U, the flagellum and the eukaryotic cell, you're going to see it's a little bit different. That is one of the things I ask y'all about on the difference. But see how this one is anchored down here in the cell membrane, and then it's anchored again up here in the outer membrane. Whereas the flagellum in the gram positive is just anchored once down here in the cell membrane. The reason that that's even important is because the gram negative ends up with a little bit more control over its flip flagellar arrangement over its flagellum because the purpose of being anchored here in the cell membrane is that's how it gets its signals. How does this thing know to spin clockwise or counterclockwise or do a run or a tumble? Well, the cell is, is signal, is sensing. Right? It's got proteins and lipids embedded all over the place in that cell membrane and that peptidoglycan layer that are constantly sensing, sending out proteins, almost like hunters, saying, go see if you can find us a nutrient, go see if you can find water, go check the pH, go check the temperature. Is it too hot over there? Oh, it's too acidic over here. And all those signals are sent back to the cell and routed to the flagellum telling it what to do. A little bit more control on that one. It's getting more input because it's anchored in two different locations. I want to test what we have to name those. That if you give us a picture, and we have to name them. Uh, parts. Um, like the outer membrane, the body, the body. Oh. We don't even have to do that. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to have y'all be able to identify gram positive and gram negative cell types on your exam. I'm also going to have y'all be able to identify the parts of the flagellum, right? You've got the filament, the hook, and then the body. Now, as far as having, asking you questions about how they're anchored, I want you to know that they're anchored differently and why that's even important, but I'm not going to have y'all like draw structures here and try to anchor these or anything like that. Okay, this is a good place to stop. We're fixing to move to the interior of the cell. So we'll save the interior for um, next week. Let's do lab. Y'all yes. need to step out and take a break for a second. Go ahead and do that.